thank you all for joining in for this very interesting development and i think uh, we will we have some very interesting discussion lined up for you on on this session here which will of course maybe hopefully answer some questions or at least give you enough food for thought as we look at these new set of regulations governing overseas investments so just as a very quick background to this the, the the development here as we all know this was one piece of regulation which was much much awaited and i think uh, it, every time when we were asked and we thought this is around the corner the the, the regulations kept getting pushed back and obviously with a lot of feedback and consultation that the rbi had undertaken as a part of this exercise uh, it had obviously kind of started creating some anxiety if i may put it because a lot of the structures involving any overseas investments were all getting kind of deferred pending the uh, outcome and, and i it was not only for corporate india whether it was for funds gps all of them and, and hence this was something which obviously had kind of raised a lot of expectation of whether rbi as a part of its mandate to further liberalize and rationalize regulations governing overseas investment is going to kind of kind of walk the talk based on what was expected so just as a background rbi did come out with its draft regulation way back in august 21 and obviously that itself set the uh, expectations rolling and following that there was an extensive consultation that rbi undertook with the industry and all of that has kind of finally culminated into these set of uh, regulations i think before we and then obviously to analyze this we have uh, our co-panelists over here and uh, just as a very quick introduction we have uh, moin lada he is part of our uh, partner in the regulatory practice and almost our go-to person for anything when it comes to uh, dealing with RBI regulations and all of that. We have uh, Anuj Shah joining us from our Singapore office. Uh, part of he's a corporate partner and also part of our private client practice as well. So he deals with a lot of Indian corporates looking at uh, globalizing their businesses, and I think he'll give us a good perspective for corporate India. And then we have uh, Bijal Ajinkya, our partners, tax partner, and also uh, private client practice uh, leader. Uh, and she will obviously, she's someone who's been dealing with some of these issues from a stakeholder perspective, uh, whether it's founders, GPs, or uh, for that matter, even funds in a way and family offices so i think we should be getting some very interesting perspective from each of them but before we kind of delve into the discussion and then kind of go into more details i wanted to kick start uh, with you moin i think it's it's been a set of uh, i mean the architecture of this regulation and i think rbi has been kind of uh, coming out with this new format of regulations which breaking away from a traditional way where it was a regulation and only some directions or notifications coming from time to time. Do you want to kind of share a quick perspective of what's kind of driven this and what's really been the ethos behind this? Sure, so thank you so much uh, for the good overview and the introduction. So I think uh, the genesis of this change comes from a proposal that was part of the Finance Act of 2015. What was decided is that there would be a distribution or a split in the powers of government and reserve banks so far as certain capital account transactions. In 2019, there was a notification and we saw a change and shift, similar shift so far as foreign direct investment is concerned. And uh, we got the NDI rules same way as part and you know in furtherance to that same amendment uh oti rules have now been notified and uh, they were as you mentioned it much awaited because even we've been you know been getting questions from clients for almost over a year now and when it will get notified since the time we shared our comments and uh, <clears throat> so now there is a split in the same fashion like fdi where 
equity instruments and equity capital investments overseas is now part of the rules which is what the government has taken control of and debt instruments continue to be with the reserve bank of india which is part of the regulations uh, in terms of the effect and, and then in terms of the effect of this i think this is going to really be beneficial because there are there are a lot of amendments or uh, you know proposals which used to take a long time because there were discussions and consultations there were inconsistencies in fdi at least i can say where you know a, a direction would say something and the policy would say something else so this approach now has clearly bifurcated the powers uh, so this will really streamline the policy making rule making in addition to that given the dynamic nature of the business environment and the global opportunities that indian businesses are having the rules and regulations both now give flexibility to notify the limits etc so one example is if you see the rules and regulations uh, it did mention about the 1 billion limit of oti for every financial year but the direction said rbi separately came out with came up with this uh, limit so why we had the rules and regulations in 2004 and the revamping and the complete overhaul it just happened now with this new structure and format uh, it should be easier to notify or revise these amounts independently as part of uh, you know the, uh, the current set of rules so that's really a quick background uh, so, so no interesting and i think the way we look at it and at least my perspective here is the the exercise kind of declutters the the framework in a way the regulations start laying down the principles the rules kind of lay down the uh, the guidance and, and obviously the directions elaborate so in in some sense the obviously while it at times uh, become overwhelming to look at three set of kind of guidelines but i think the approach definitely has been to declutter and to a great extent i think as we go along we can at the end of it conclude whether it's done it that fully or is it something where something more is desired so just kind of continuing on the same principle i think uh, moin i'll want you to kind of start off because this is the first time where i think uh, the effort has been made to kind of yeah. define a lot of terms which were not kind of defined in the earlier regime and then the key one being the odi and opi overseas direct investment and overseas portfolio investment do you want to kind of give us uh, the perspective on what's really now covered under each of these <coughs> so i'll uh, thank you said i think uh, yes this is one of the most interesting and most sought after concept so to say and by the end of this response we'll also try and conclude whether we really achieved what we wanted but the historical background is that every time we invested the way definition of overseas direct investment and joint venture was captured it qualified as an overseas direct investment so the what this portfolio was always debated there were various discussions comments of well dealer bank had their views that below 10% could be uh, a portfolio investment but in the erstwhile law the only place when it spoke of portfolio investment was in the context of listed companies making investments in other listed companies with a shorter net worth that's about 50% of their own net worth uh, what, what was expected and what was submitted as part of the comments was that this should be extended to all the forms of investment because if you are a minority holder to continually report to continually provide information annually is a challenging uh, situation and that creates a big uh, concern Uh, there were also other ODI related restrictions which shouldn't have applied to lower, lesser investment uh, thresholds below 10%, which are in more financial in nature. But uh, now I will very simply lay down what the current set of provisions is allowing and how OPI and ODI are different. So if you're an Indian listed company, you're able to do both overseas direct investment and overseas portfolio investment. Portfolio investment obviously is with a lesser net worth of 50%, which was the case even earlier. If you're an unlisted Indian company, you're able to do portfolio only in listed companies in very specific situations. So just clarifying for everyone's benefit that you cannot do overseas portfolio investment in an unlisted company abroad at the moment as an unlisted company. the only cases where you can do even in a listed company is in a rights of bonus issue a uh, swap of test the merger or amalgamation the concern here is that how do i originally hold those shares 
And if I originally hold shares in the ODI route, because that is all that was permitted till now, how will I take advantage of overseas portfolio investment? So there is a clarification we are hoping to get around this. And everything that we're talking about is really, this is our reading, this is a new law. There is an FNQ clarification and discussion with RBI continuing even now. The other case is individuals. Uh, this was also very well debated because startup founders would invest initially, other people would try to use their funds and invest. So as an individual, uh, you can invest in listed companies, that is fine. And in unlisted companies also, an individual can do overseas portfolio investment, but only in case of ESOPs, where they're employees and they get stock options, sweat equity, or if they're getting a sort of a management share. Another key aspect which is relevant to distinguish and uh, you know categorize your investment as overseas direct or overseas portfolio is control. And for the first time, they now mentioned the definition with a monetary threshold of shareholding, which is 10%. So if you have control in an entity, it becomes your overseas direct investment. If you cross 10% or without crossing 10%, you have certain rights or certain controlling rights. So I think to sum up, while we have taken the first step, actually defined portfolio investment or overseas investment, it is still uh, only limited to listed companies and in very few cases can individuals and unlisted companies access this. So it's a good step forward, but uh, there's a lot more that we desire and a lot more that was submitted and proposed as part of this uh, sort of amendment. And, and, and I think we will, as a part of the discussion, come to that. Uh, maybe towards the end of what are the misses. So I think for each of you, you should kind of keep that list at some level. But just moving on, I think uh, to bring you on, uh, Anuj, and I think corporate India, I think is something, uh, it's one stakeholder in the economy, which was kind of also very eagerly waiting for this. And, and in many sense, I think it reflects the aspiration of Indian uh, corporates. Today, the businesses and opportunities are far more global. And I think with the way the industry has grown, I think for a lot of them, uh, their aspiration is to become multinationals. And an ODI regulation obviously becomes a threshold kind of regulation for many of them when they're looking at uh, investments overseas. How do you see the new set of regulations? And I think uh, how would you see this kind of meeting the, those aspirations of the Indian corporates? Thank you for that question, Sid. You know, as you mentioned, we were all eagerly waiting for these regulations and more so we've been waiting for them uh, since the draft rules became public uh, for public comments uh, by the Reserve Bank of India last August. You know, as we were also discussing ahead of this call, uh, this is a massive step in the journey of liberalization we feel and this significantly adds to uh, the government's mandate uh, of uh, allowing indian corporates to have ease in doing business uh, to me personally as we're also discussing in our wider group this shows the sign of maturity of our businesses and it's also a clear sign by the government and the reserve bank of india that they want indian companies to go overseas compete with the best of the world uh, best of the companies in the world and you know now you've asked me i list down several that it's a full package if you see some are path breaking changes i would say some are small changes but if you look at the package i think it's very attractive and uh, really you know, commendable job done to my mind and you know the devil's always in the detail so there are some misses as we discussed towards the end mm -hmm. but broadly i feel uh, what they've done is fairly commendable the two biggest changes that would significantly add in my mind to the ability of Indian corporates to go international, compete with the best globally, are burying the ghost of round tripping and expressly blessing it with some belts and suspenders. And the second one is to permit Indian corporates, not in financial sector, services sector, to invest overseas in financial services sector. And we know that Indian corporates were significantly hamstrung in the past in pursuing their global aspirations. Several deals had to be aborted because of these uh, two issues. Uh, we tried to structure them in many ways, put our heads, several lawyers in the room, but several of these deals never saw the light of the day because of these two challenges. Now, my colleague Moin, who's an expert on regulatory matters, will delve 
much deeper into these issues. I don't want to steal his thunder anymore. Uh, so let me talk more about it. But if I have to talk of a few more aspects that I think will significantly add to the power of Indian corporates to acquire assets overseas, it would be first permitting deferred consideration. Uh, you know, we know that under these regulations, deferred in, uh, consideration for overseas investment has expressly been allowed. Uh, all this while, we had this dichotomy that non-residents could acquire Indian assets and defer the consideration. But when Indian companies had to make outward remittances, uh, there was a lack of flexibility to defer the consideration. So in that sense, I feel there's been a leveling of that field. Uh, the regulations go on to say that there is no cap on the amount of deferred consideration or time period for deferment, which I think is a very welcome uh, uh, proposal uh, by the government. And just they say that the term of the document should be defined as a de definite period from the date of the agreement. Now, if I have to talk about a second gem, as I call it, uh, is, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, that the new regulations now permit swaps under automatic. And this can, this can give so much fillip to deal making, the way we structure our deals. We know that under the erstwhile regulations, there was lack of clarity whether swaps are permitted or not. Uh, lawyers, advisors, accountants across firms would have different views. Some would say primary swaps are allowed. Some would say both primary and secondary are allowed. And then there will be like, several banks who say none of this is allowed. So it was a uh, total confusion in the earlier regime. Now, under the new ODI regime, it has been clarified that ODI may be made or held by way of swap of shares. Uh, with the introduction of this provision, all kinds of swaps, primary and secondary, to my mind, are permitted under the automatic route. I could tell you that still I hear there's some confusion amongst banks, uh, authorized dealers, lawyers, accountants. So, you know, this is uh, some of our quick interpretations. We were also discussing that uh, as we receive more clarification, some of it may change. Uh, but as of now, the plain reading of the law suggests that swaps are permitted, both primary and secondary. Uh, we'll have some uh, smaller hoops to cross some amendments to be made to non-debt investment rules etc to operationalize these amendments but i think it's more procedural in nature. Uh, the third big change to my mind is you know uh, focusing on this ease of doing business is uh, ability to write off foreign investments because we had losses in uh, those foreign investments or restructure of foreign holdings now these were you know these were just few things which were constraining the ability of Indian companies. And, you know, it was always looked with suspicion that you made investment. Why do you want to write off? Why do you want to restructure? And now suddenly it's a 360 uh, degree turn, if I may say, and there's so much trust being shown, so much, uh, I would say, uh, uh, faith being shown in Indian government, uh, Indian businesses that go ahead, do what you do. Uh, follow some bells and suspenders, but full flexibility to do things what you like. And to explain yeah. the restructuring part a little bit, uh, under the erstwhile regime, RBI approval was required for an unlisted Indian entity for restructuring the balance sheet of the overseas overseas entity, uh, involving write-off of up to 25% of the investment. Uh, now the restructuring of balance sheet is permitted for a foreign entity, which has been incurring losses for previous two years, as evidenced by the last audited balance sheets. There are some prerequisites such as a certification for diminution in value uh, on an arm's length basis by a registered valuer. Uh, and uh, then it says that the requirement of certificate applies uh, where the amount of investment is more than $10 million or in case where the amount of such diminution exceeds 20%. So these were to my mind the big ticket changes, but if I can just touch it, if I have uh, the uh, two mm -hmm. more minutes, and then there are these package of small, small changes. I mean, you are an expert of, on AIF and nobody understands it to my mind better than you, the GIF city and all the changes that have happened there. So we will at some stage take the moderator role and ask you that sure. question on everything that has changed on the AIF front. But let's see even smaller changes. Let Indian entities not engaged in insurance sector may make ODI in general or health insurance. I mean, so much flexibility available to non uh, uh, non-finance companies. In India. Now we have deemed approval for several things. I mean, now the law says that when a company that is under investigation or whose accounts have been declared NPAs wants to make an ODI, they don't need an NOC. 
uh, they need an NOC from a bank or the investigating agency, and if the concerned agency fails to provide you an NOC in 60 days, it's deemed up. So again, a very welcome change. Uh, the big Philip on IFSC is what you will cover. I think there is clarification on making debt investments. Earlier, there was a lot of confusion, all these funny structures, if I may say, buy one share and then put in debt in the foreign company. Now it's very clear. You have to have 10% shareholding or control in the company. Then you see the way they have allowed trusts in uh, education and hospital. Yeah. But yeah, some of these uh, things. I think I, I want you to hold on to some of that and then maybe just kind of we'll come back to this time permitting and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but uh, I think you are right. Uh, there seems to be at least some reciprocation from the regulator and in terms of trust being shown and the operational ease of doing business. So this obviously makes Indian corporates uh, kind of able to compete globally when they're looking at transactions, whether it's tender offers to be made, there earlier there was a question whether that will be permitted i need to go to rbi for an hour a lot of that has been addressed as a part of it so i, I think it's it should be a, uh, in in some sense a game changer for indian corporates when they're globalizing looking at i think just uh, on, on on that point i thought it would also be important before we come to the other important stakeholder uh, for uh, GPs and family offices, BGL. I just want to bring Moin in back onto one of the key aspects that uh, Anuj you also touched upon around round tripping. And I think that's a concept which has always existed, but never in in any any written form was ever kind of communicated. And, and it, there was always a shroud of mystery around that whether it's permitted, not permitted, or not. Obviously, I think a lot will still evolve, as, as you rightly said, Moin, that engagement with RBI would be on. But in many cases, people are finding the, the reference here and how it is being interpreted to be too good to be true. Do you want to kind of try to kind of yeah. elaborate on how is that issue being addressed? And, and then maybe we can kind of also bring that in on other structures as we go along. Sure, sir. and as you mentioned, this looks too good to be true, and this is a topic which has a lot of history from the beginning. So, just to you know, very quickly, some of the history around this is from 2015-16 onwards. There were questions around such structures. Only in 2019, there was an FAQ which said that you cannot have the FDI OEI structure. That was the first time we saw it in, in sort of a clear, uh, you know, sort of a document where it is. Uh, where it was laid down that you cannot have such structures with an India connection. Um, all orders or, you know, sort of settlement orders that RBI gave always mentioned one thing that when you are investing in this structure, it is not a investment in the nature of bona fide business investment. And that really is, I mean, I'm starting with this is because that's a key aspect which we need to even consider today. Today, the new rules in 19 are saying that the restriction will not apply so long as you don't, you know, cross that two-layer threshold. And uh, before I get to what could be read as two-layer threshold and what we are reading it as, uh, the question is that you still have to ensure that the structure exists for a bona fide business purpose. I think that's the first thing for any overseas investment or any debt funding or anything that we're doing. That's the first. Uh, condition we need and uh, the first condition we should evaluate once you've gone through that condition the uh, issue is about layers and the way i am looking at it and as we speak you know we we've been getting you know getting approvals just before this new law got notified a couple of clients were waiting some approvals were pending so we've actually been discussing and also seeking confirmations with uh, but the way it is looking because of the way definition is of, uh, of subsidiary is that you have an Indian entity here, uh, which is investing in a structure, which may be a Singapore. Singapore would then be um, maybe let's say Netherlands, and then back to India. So two two foreign companies back to India as a structure, which seems to be what is intended to be permitted. Obviously, subject to all other conditions of bona fide business limit sector, etc. Uh, there are certain exemptions. And there is a cross-reference to the company's rules of layering. 
but that reference seems to be very limited to those exemptions that banking companies, historically important companies, insurance companies, etc. The other carve outs of wholly owned subsidy, etc., under those rules cannot be applied today. Uh, but <clears throat> and another thing is that uh, whether it is in IFSC, and I'm sure Sridhar is an expert, and Anup said he is going to tell us more about it, or otherwise, this round tripping waiver doesn't seem to be available. And uh, mm -hmm. so, therefore, if we are having these layer structures up to two layers, uh, it should now be allowed. But I would recommend that all conditions of bona fide business be discussed and you discuss this with your authorized dealer bank probably get a written clarification because all of this is currently in the, you know, currently very new law. We are all reading it, interpreting it, and okay, we may come up uh, with sort of clarification still. So I think uh, the other two things is that when we, whenever we got approvals, there were several conditions on how you will do business, what kind of dividend payments will be done, what repatriation will be done, all of those also are not here. So this discussion of liberalizing this from 2019 has finally seen the light of the day and I think it's a welcome change. And I'm uh, hopeful that, you know, a lot of these genuine business structures where there is an India connection uh, that uh, can now, will now be easily you know, possible to make investments in. Because otherwise, the timeline, if you go under the approval, is substantial. You know? yeah. yeah, I think Anuj, you want to come in with some. I want to, you know, I want to ask a question to Moin, which I am getting asked by a lot of my clients, sir, and which is because everyone thinks it is too good to be true, as you said, that we used to say in, there was a lot of doubt on investments, whether investments is bona fide business activity, and earlier uh, we'll go pillar to post. Uh, everyone will have different views. And now the regs sort of, to me, make it very clear that investment is a bona fide activity, but you know, suddenly we're all finding it too good to be true. And investments mm -hmm. can only be made in a bona fide activity. And Moin, so I thought, you know, why not Moin clarifies at least, and we know this is our personal view, some of it may change when clarifications come, but at this true. point in time, uh, is it too good to be true? So Anuj, uh, you're, Anuj, you're right. Uh, currently there is a window where one could say that just investment could be a bona fide business activity. And uh, I'm not sure if you want to deal with it when we speak more about financial services related liberalization, but that is there. And uh, probably when we're discussing that aspect, uh, we can get into more detail how. Um, also, you may not necessarily need to be regulated abroad. You could just be in the business of holding investments, but it is subject to a certain yeah. condition. So I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to see if I should continue now or should we come back to that and discuss in more detail? No, we, we, we can maybe, I think we can come back uh that separately because i think but i think the way i would summarize this uh, on the round tripping i think including our clients our partner here also is still in that zone of too good to be true as you can see <laughs> and, and, and i think uh, that's that's the uh, but i i definitely think rbi has obviously taken a a giant leap if i may put it if this is indeed yeah. at least captured in the letter of the law and i think that is a big step because i think it kind of declutters a lot of questions around uh, investments overseas and to that extent it is definitely a very welcome move so i think let me with that uh, bring in uh, bijal and i think uh, this is clearly and i think from uh, for the participants over here and and the and our clients uh, obviously, I wanted to bring in the perspective of especially a uh, few important stakeholders and maybe we'll start off with the, the GP or the fund manager's perspective out here. And, and obviously, over the last whatever 18 months or so, every time we were faced with the structuring question, uh, GPs were always and then the uh, standard answer was that, okay, it, it, this is the current position, but the new ODI regulations can obviously change a lot of it. And now that it's in front of us, Bijal, do you want to share your perspective? How does this affect the life of GPs and their business? I think it would be very important to hear that. Sure, thank you, sir. So it seems like uh, you know the GPs have really made a special representation to the RBI because. As with financial services, the regulations, the changes which have been made seem too good to be true. Of course, it's a bittersweet pill. There are certain aspects which have not been as best covered. Uh, 
I would essentially say that with respect to GP, the main changes we've seen, especially for global uh, funds, have been with respect to setting up of global structures, capital commitment or co-invest, which is you know really the skin in the game, as well as carried interest structures in their global investment vehicles. We'll first discuss the change in the law which will affect co-invest capital commitment by Indian-based GPs, and this is essentially something which is most important for global funds which have Indian advisory arms. As you would know that it is a common practice in the investment funds world where senior level investment principles are required to make capital commitments to the global investing vehicles so as to participate in the global investment. And that's really bringing in all the GPs together around the world to essentially say that you are responsible for every market. Since these vehicles would be making investments generally also into India, under the old law, such investments would have been regarded as a portfolio investment in the vehicle and hence was permitted. However, it was always couched with a disclaimer that the monies coming from India cannot be invested directly or indirectly back into India in terms of round tripping. I mean, this was all the spirit of exchange control. Of course, the letter of law did not really provide for a specific restriction. And of course, money at the end of it in the fund bank account is fungible. And to that extent, only the segregation was really advised. These are the funds which came from India, India GPs. Under the new regulations, as Mohan mentioned, with respect to the LRS, there is a distinction between ODI as well as OPI offshore direct investment and offshore portfolio investment and an investment in a global fund by an India-based GP would be regarded as an OPI, especially given the fact that uh, uh, given the fact that it is not a really controlling stake. Now such an investment would be permitted even though the entity is not listed as there is a specific carve out for an international regulated and registered investment fund. So I think this is a really a silver lining wherein an Indian resident individual henceforth can make an investment into an internationally regulated investment fund. However, of course, this investment needs to be within the $250,000 requirement and where it may actually hit Indian GPs would be the fact that in most situations, these international funds are only permitted for accredited investors. And there is generally a minimum requirement of a commitment to be given. And whether or not the $250,000 per year through the commitment period would be sufficient or not is something which is a question mark. However, there are structures which could be considered by these India-based GPs for essentially making the co-invest obligation. I think the silver lining again is the fact that it does not really have this requirement or this stint with respect to whether the funds are coming back to India or not. So that's definitely uh, you know, a great benefit which India-based GPs will now have and they would be able to participate in global co-invest structure. Now moving on to the next, and I think this is going to be uh, you know, something which most GPs are going to be extremely concerned about especially with respect to carried interest. It's become a common phenomenon where global participation in carried interest uh, is essentially undertaken vis-a-vis -vis GPs around the world. Whether or not the uh, carried interest is with respect to uh, you know, an investment which has been advised by the GP or not, the entire pool is a global pool. Under the old regulation, such investment was really regarded as a portfolio investment and hence an investment was permitted by Indian resident GPs given the fact that there was no controlling stake. Under the new regulations due, due to the demarcation of ODI and OPI and given that generally an international carried interest vehicle is an unlisted entity, an investment in such an entity can be done only if it is an ODI and LRS is not permitted in financial services vehicle. Of course, whether it's considered bona fide or not bona fide is, of course, a different discussion. But it may be, you know, whether an investing vehicle per se 
is considered as a financial services vehicle is not really very clear. And if such a vehicle is regarded as a financial services vehicle, then a participation by an Indian GP is not permitted. There could be alternate structures which could be explored, you know, either through a global stock option plan or through an investment through the Indian advisory entity. But of course, that would have to be globally or carefully carved out. The third that I would see it is uh, with respect to investment managers in India who've been wanting to set up international funds as well as international investment manager structure under the new regulations. An Indian investment manager vehicle can set up a subsidiary outside of India. And of course, depending on whether or not it's considered as engaged in financial services, an approval of the Reserve Bank of India may be required. So I would say these are the three main changes which would affect GPs mm -hmm. in India. And by and large, I mean, I would think that the regulations have really provided a great deal of relief. Thank, thanks, Bijal, and I think maybe just to kind of quickly summarize and uh, our understanding of this so far. So very clearly, co-investment uh, by the Indian uh, GP's investment team, I think that's a positive in a way that it has kind of enabled. Some wrinkles around the language here, but in terms of while the direction seems to be very clear on this, regulations have not fully kind of address so there may be some clarity required from rbi but at least there's a letter under the direction suggesting that investments in an overseas fund is an opi and would be permitted clearly i think the big kind of hurdle this now creates for carry structure is the fact that with the definition of odi being all encompassing in a way and, and, and any unlisted entity investment is deemed to be odi it would create a potential challenge in some sense. So I think uh, that is a, so, and then third of course, is the issue of setting up operations of management, fund management operations offshore. Obviously there's been a relaxation, which I'll just come to that as a part of the financial services. So from a GP side, mixed bag so far, I think a uh, lot of positive, but obviously some challenges to be tackled in terms of structuring of the carried interest, et cetera. I think, uh, and, and obviously uh, we'll, we'll come to that uh, in a bit, but maybe it would be a right time to maybe get uh, maybe Anuj or Mo in one of you to talk about the financial services. And I think that is one of the changes which has obviously uh, been highlighted as one of the key changes that the distinction that existed between ODI in financial services versus ODI in any other business seems to have got diluted significantly. So maybe, I don't know, Anuj, you want to take that up in terms of uh, from a financial services or or maybe Moen, if, either way. I mean, I think, I think yeah, maybe I can just tell you, yeah, maybe better Moen goes, I think is... Uh, uh, if you want I'm to on do. fine, thank you. So uh, I think uh, financial services was always the sector where we used to always say that, you know, this is an approval room sector. This has conditionalities, and the precondition was that you have to be in the same business licensed in India. And most likely, when you're investing the entity overseas, also have to be licensed. So that stays the same. You have to have the three year profit track record. You have to take a no objection from your regulator in India, which could be either the SEBI or the Reserve Bank of India if you're a non banking financial company. Uh, the only relaxation, so to say, for that is that if you look at for the three-year profit in 2021 and 21 22 if you were impacted by covid you could look at a longer period uh, so you don't lose that opportunity to now invest if you had if you didn't have the same track record in these years impacted by the pandemic what is the most uh, important change and the shift now is that even if you are not in the financial services business and you want to explore investment opportunities abroad and uh, you know, invest your surplus fund, you can now do that. And uh, I will quickly, and the only condition to meet then is the three year profit track record. So this makes you flexible. It lets you do the investment if you have the three year profit track record, so long as you continue to do some operating activity of business, because you need to be watchful of the fact that your investment and your income and gains from such investment abroad 
cannot exceed 50% of the total amount. Otherwise, you will qualify for financial services in India as well. Now, if you are a regulated entity, not only do you have the requirement to go for an approval, but you're also subject to various other norms that are applicable in your by your sector regulator. Let's take an example of an unbanking financial company. In addition to, so while 400% net worth limit under the ODI rules, you have to ensure it's within 100% of your net owned fund because of the NBFC rules. In addition to that, there's an exposure norm that you can't expose more than 15% uh, to a single uh, entity. So all those issues, you know, sort of make it very restrictive. But if you're using an operating business, non-financial business, I think this is a great opportunity and a, a new avenue for Indian corporates, Indian operating businesses to explore various investment opportunities abroad. And uh, with the only three-year profit track record, uh, you know, condition, it really eases the process because there's no approval. Also, what it appears to be today is that this is under the general permission. So I think this Could is going to be a great opportunity for approach for investments. Yeah. Yeah. And Sid, if I can just... No, I was saying, uh, you know, if I can supplement to what Moin is saying, yeah. he articulated it very well. But, you know, just if even if we talk about leveling the field, look at instance today, a non-financial company overseas can come and buy our financial assets in India, of course, with necessary permissions and all. So why should you hamstring, again, Indian corporates from going mm -hmm. overseas and restricting them and let's say you know theoretically let's say some of our best groups Tata's, reliances or whoever cartridges uh, uh, they want to add uh, a, a consumer company wants to get into financial company overseas uh, why should be uh, they be hamstrung when the other way is allowed so i think again it's leveling the field it was much awaited and uh, i'm glad that uh, you know, uh, again this is maturity of the market and uh, faith in uh, indian corporates uh, to allow them an apply business. I think it may also have a lot of implications set to my mind on fintech companies, I feel. Because Absolutely. as these companies go overseas, want to go overseas, and these lines are all converging, what is tech, what is finance, there's always been a lot of confusion that can a tech company in India uh, do these overseas uh, deals and will it be finance of your tech? So those, uh, that, that it gives a lot of flip and a lot of tailwinds to those companies to go outside and uh, do these acquisitions like yeah no so i think you're right uh, no and no, no, i think it does create a kind of a level playing field in a way and then and, and i think uh, this also kind of opens up a lot of opportunities for from a from an industry perspective i think clearly this is one big change for fund managers as well and i think this is something which will trigger a lot of them kind of whether it is setting up operations outside India or in gift and I think with that maybe I thought I should also uh, touch upon uh, IFSC and I think how the regulations have kind of dealt with that so maybe I'll just take a few minutes to kind of give some context here because I think IFSC under the regulations has been given a special treatment and I mean I think this is not very surprising in a way how we have seen this evolve and to be fair i think with its constitution and the authority ifsc authority taking charge uh, in in uh, 2020 and uh, where they kind of actually started promoting and building this jurisdiction as a as an international finance center comparable to any other global markets and this seems to be driven primarily by two objective and then maybe comfort if you may put it this way one clearly i think ifsc is something which uh, needs to be promoted because obviously that's relatively a new kid in the block and when it is competing with more developed international finance centers like uh, singapore or uh, luxembourg or mauritius for that matter or dubai i think it needed uh, some kind of support policy support but more importantly, I think while giving it a deemed foreign territory status, RBI has also recognized the fact that any outbound investment into IFSC, even though it goes as foreign currency, does not leave the shores of the country. And then to that extent, unlike the ODI to non-IFSC, 
this is something where they have lesser concern of really a foreign exchange flowing out so combined reading of that uh, and of course with the great effort being put in by the ifsc authority and all in putting representations i think there has been a clear carve out made for any investment being made by residents into ifsc so obviously that's going to be a bright spot in a way when you look at uh, fund structures when you look at family offices or for that matter even entities looking to engage in financial services uh, like aircraft leasing and all so this kind of opens up ifsc for any resident so where the, the framework basically says that any person resident in india irrespective of whether it's an individual a listed entity or an unlisted entity you are free to make investment into ifsc uh, in in compliance with of course the broader odi or opi regulations but with a specific carve out that first important one that if it is an individual and and, and uh, i mean uh, where it's a entity you you are doing it in a financial because gift city or ifsc largely as the entity would qualify as a financial services sector the conditions of financial investing in a financial services both by indian entities engaged in financial services or by entities not engaged in financial services which moin just touched upon one of the condition which has been carved out which is a big relief is that if the indian entity is not in a financial services space it can go ahead and make investments into a gift city without having to meet the net profit criteria what it means that today if a newly incorporated entity in india wants to set up say a fund management business in gift today it was subjected to all those conditions of financial services and then it had to otherwise go for an approval route this kind of opens up the opportunity for individuals or indian gps to go out and create fund management entities in uh, gift city without the need for a prior approval or having to go back for uh, approval from rbi because of that the second i think is uh, also an investment in funds and i think that is another big one as i look at it that investment by indian entities in funds which are organized or investment funds or vehicles which are organized in gift city has been deemed to be a opi and a portfolio investment and that again creates or positions gift as a great platform for indian businesses or for indian investors to invest overseas and i think there is a growing community of indian investors uh, who are looking at opportunities overseas and fund managers who are looking to tap into this i think this change can be a game changer in using gift as a platform for such investments overseas and i think that that kind of makes it very very attractive uh, of course this will be treated as an lrs but the fact that it is an opi and i think again the implied reading of this uh, in a way opi is something which is not subjected at least from the plain reading to the round tripping concerns and i think there was always this question that when i'm making a portfolio investment overseas how do i control or manage uh, these investments where uh, whether they have a downstream investments into india and then to that extent the current reading seems to suggest that if it's a portfolio investment where it's a non control then you don't have to be worried or you don't you are not constrained by having to see whether there is a one layer two layer or a complex structure involved so that i think becomes a very very important change of course more guidance from rbi will emerge i feel uh, as uh, the structures get uh, uh, kind of uh, more utilized i think more clarity will come around that so to that extent the only condition that exists and i think just as a constraint if you may put it is that anyone individual basically investing into a gift city a financial services entity that gift city entity cannot have a step down subsidiary or entities outside so to that extent a single layer structure is what has been permitted today 
for residents to invest in gift city but i would say this in many ways would become a game changer for uh, for indians investing abroad as well as for fund managers and gift has already started seeing a lot of uh, kind of uh, shift so i think that that's something which i wanted to also kind of lay out for the audience here i'm also mindful of the time so i, I think maybe we'll yeah yeah come in more. yeah more. i just wanted to just add one, one statement to that that you know just an example we apply for approvals from financial regulators but if it's in the gift city within 45 days it will be a team approval so that's also another relief yeah, that's also, at, uh, so i think they they've really put pressure on the other relevant regulators so you used to kind of wait for months yeah. to get an noc for an indian entity to set up or invest in gifts i think here it's a deemed approval if the regulator does not uh, approve within 45 days very progressive and, and uh, bring efficiency to the process maybe i'll come back to you bijal uh, on this i think one of the other important stakeholder if you may put it has been the family offices or an ultra hni is looking at investing overseas how does this new set of uh, odi regulation kind of really uh, cater to their needs if you can kind of quickly touch upon that sure sure yeah so definitely this has been a new trend which we have seen over the last two years where indian families desire to have a global uh, you know exposure to investing and have been keen to invest you know outside of india under the previous regulations family offices would generally uh, you know be an investing vehicle or an entity engaged in financial services and hence would require an rbi approval to set up a subsidiary outside of india this approval was highly discretionary and whether or not it would be available was always a question mark however now a and a company which was not engaged in financial services was not permitted to set up a wholly owned subsidiary outside of india which would be just a mere investing vehicle a welcome change as mohan mentioned especially in the financial services space where, which has been made uh, where an investment in an offshore financial services company is permitted even if at all the indian company is an operating company and not an entity engaged in financial services hence a family office which has some operating business can hence both set up a subsidiary outside of india and make serve and make investments in that particular company which would then make the financial instrument investment they would like to without any uh, regulatory approval so long as that indian company has a positive net worth for at least 3 years and of course the covid conditions which mohan mentioned will equally apply here for family offices which are registered with rbi or uh, you know as a financial services entity would require to take an approval of the rbi and of course they would require a positive net worth to for 3 years this will really be a big sigh of relief to a lot number of indian families who have been extremely desirous of taking uh, you know setting up a global family office outside of india so that's the change you know which will affect indian families and and then what about uh, founders and Uh, others who would be i mean whether the implications of this on flip structures or something which we've seen yeah so i think uh, you know uh, especially with covid we've seen a number of techies as well as inventors really relocating to india from the west coast and the likes and we've seen the birth of a number of tech companies with this birth of tech companies all in india we've seen a number of them really uh, you know recognizing the fact that they may get better valuation from investors including private equity if they have an international holding structure as well as the listing possibilities would be better if they are outside of india now such a flip requires an rbi approval and though under the new regulations indian resident individuals can invest up to 250000 dollars in an operating company outside of india they cannot invest if the control of such company is in the hands of the of an indian resident as well as there are two levels of subsidiaries of this particular offshore company now i think this is something which will be like uh, you know a show stopper for a number of founders you know especially where a company is at a stage where they do require much more hand holding and to that extent the control factor which may be required and to that extent though this may be acceptable to a number of investors 
that may not surely be acceptable to founders who would require control. So if the control criteria can be reconsidered, that would really be great. I think it's it's going to be, and I think uh, obviously uh, in 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 one sense it has kind of by recognizing the round tripping has kind of supported in some sense structures with uh, overseas holding. On the other hand, with the control and individual uh, basically uh, being all of this classified as ODI in any unlisted entity, I think it will have some wrinkle around that. So obviously, uh, we one needs to kind of see how this unfolds, but definitely uh, a point to uh, uh, keep in mind. I think, uh, I know we are all uh, running out of time and I think there are already questions coming and just for the audience here, you may put, post your questions uh, in the chat box. We'll try to cover as many as we can uh, in the within the given time constraint. So, but before I wrap up, maybe from, uh, each of you and maybe uh, if you want to kind of quickly touch upon what do you think were kind of the misses in your from your client perspective from your uh, assessment i think that would also be helpful because this is an exercise which will be ongoing the consultation so i think it would be helpful to get some perspective there. moin you want to go first yes yes for sure so I think uh, very quickly I, on the topics that I really spoke of, I'll try and capture those. So ODI, OPI has created a very strange situation where if now an unlisted company wants to invest in a listed company abroad and the investment is below 10, they may not be able to do it because it qualifies as an overseas portfolio investment and that's only allowed in certain cases. So that is one thing that needs to get clarified because I don't have the right opportunity to invest. Second is that the definition of portfolio investment, my view, should expand to unlisted investments as well. That's when there'll be an advantage, uh, you know, of having lesser disclosure requirements, lesser procedures to be followed. That is one. Uh, on the other aspect of uh, financial investments, I think it's very important that uh, other departments, that is the non-banking supervision departments or the other regulators take notice of this and integrate and bring the uh, laws at par with what the ODI uh, rules are now liberalized. For example, ODI rules allow you to invest in non-financial sector even if you are a regulated entity, but the NDFC rules do not allow you to do so. That needs to be immediately uh, bought at uh, par uh, with the chapter. And uh, on the round tripping part, it's very important that they come up with a clear example or an FAQ on layering just so that you know people can without any concerns and uh, you know issues and uh, instead of approaching for clarification they can start implementation of uh, you know uh, pro provision that is really smart of uh, letting investments and businesses be uh, going ahead so i think these were the three points i thought i'll highlight very quickly yeah, yeah. valid valid points i think i don't know uh, maybe anoj Bijal, you guys have anything to uh, quickly in, share in the of, yeah in the interest of time said i thought one big uh, uh, change or a clarification that uh, RBI, perhaps if I were to ask, I would say that look on the concept of network. It's everything's so good and you know, it's all uh, uh, wanting to do things in the future, uh, taking Indian companies internationally. I think on the concept of network, they should try and expand the limits, the definition. Also, I think, you know, the regs seem to suggest that network is on an entity basis. But because Indian con corporates are, or several of them are conglomerates, I don't know, there should be some aggregation allowed in certain circumstances. And I think uh, that is something. Is, is just on that one, uh, Mohin, is, is there some flexibility to bring in the group companies into the net worth computation? There is. For a, the, because I think, it's not, it's not uh, clear to do that at the moment. That's one. There is okay, clarification. Okay. So, Okay. So if maybe some company, clarity. Voting companies limits. If you're saying that's not really coming out clearly. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Because I think uh, the old regime had some leeway some, to some say that we could bring in group companies and all uh, subsidiaries right. and all right. to compute the network. So right. maybe that's some something which we may need to get clarity on. Yeah. Uh, Bijal, anything from your end? Just one point, I think, uh, you know, given the fact that, uh, you know, SPACs have really become a new trend of raising funds for, you know, operating businesses. 
Uh, and we've seen a number of situations where Indian companies really want to raise funds through SPAC structures from international investors. Uh, at this at, uh, currently, for a founder as well as Indian Redfin investors to really swap their Indian company share into the international listed company, which will then become the parent of the Indian company, there is an RBI approval required. Given the fact that uh, you know there is uh, you know it's just a swap of shares and international swaps are being allowed, perhaps this is something which RBI could consider. Uh, so that Indian companies can be flushed in with those funds through international SPAC structures. So that's something which uh, I feel has become a hot trend for uh, you know raising funds by Indian companies. Okay. So no, I think uh, thank, thanks a lot. I think all the panelists and obviously before I, we jump into the question. I'll try and direct it to the relevant folks here. But I think uh, it, it's been a very engaging discussion both while preparing for this, because obviously we had our own deliberations around a lot of these provisions. And you can see there's obviously some more clarity needed, but I would say, I think it's been a great uh, move on the part of RBI. And I think uh, from, a, from a policy perspective, it kind of very clearly indicates a confident India, a, a confident regulator kind of taking a step ahead towards globalizing the Indian asset. And I think that's something which I would say will be uh, creating a platform to kind of take uh, an Indian corporates, Indian uh, stakeholders into a very different zone. And we do hope that a lot of the talk in the regulations is also walked by the regulators as we go along. And, and, and I'm quite optimistic of that but obviously at the same time clarity will need to be sought on some of these uh, issues i think uh, the way i look at it uh, it seems to suggest that uh, the regulations will take us closer to the promised land of uh, where indian businesses indian residents can kind of position themselves uh, as competitively to global uh, kind of audience so I think with that, uh, I, I would like to thank each of you for sharing your thoughts. Obviously, we'll be happy to respond to other questions which we may drop, but I think I'll open this for the questions from the audience and maybe we'll try and cover as many as we can. I think the first one uh, is whether an investment in a Singapore VCC is allowed by Indian resident individuals. Uh, Moin, do you want to kind of take a shot at that? So I think uh, for individuals, investment is now allowed in two categories. Uh, it will be OTI and OPI. And uh, I would like okay. Vijal or Chad, because if it's not a, if this VCC is uh, going to be treated as uh, an unlisted debt investment or equity investment is the question. Uh, if it is being treated as an unlisted debt, it will be part of OPI. Yeah. So. Yeah, and just to add to what Moen said, uh, and, uh, you know, if the VCC is essentially registered and regulated as an investment fund, uh, you know, in Singapore, uh, you know, to that extent, uh, investment by an Indian resident individual may be permitted. Yeah. So that's another that, point. Right. It's a regulated fund. It will be permitted, but you know, even under even you know this whole ODI rules have that's now right. impacted the way LRS is worded. And LRS has now, you know, said OTI and OPI. And OPI, per se, is giving a picture of listed investments other than a very limited category of investments. So that is also something that is expected to be very clearly uh, laid down because earlier it was mutual funds, venture capital funds, and a lot of other things were mentioned, which are now been now very uh, restrictive. It, it appears to be restrictive, but, but I agree, yeah, agree so, with but, yeah, yeah, I think we'll need to uh, because I think the direction seems to be suggesting that any any vehicle which is an investment fund and then to that extent it should be possible to qualify vcc as an investment right. fund i think that has to be permitted at least for individuals and listed entity that seems to be something which has been permitted the the, the funny part of it is the operating uh, power of for this clarification doesn't seem to be captured in the 
regulations or rules. So I think that's one thing. But if you see the direction, it seems to suggest that this should be possible. Maybe we'll more clarity await it, but I think there is definitely a good chance that this is something which is a permitted investment overseas. Uh, okay, second question is, is there a difference in uh, overseas investment if the domestic entity is NBFC or non-NBFC from the angle of quantum of investment being permitted and or the investment in unlisted entity? I think you did touch upon that, uh, Mohin. Briefly, but yes, maybe... I did. Yeah, I can very quickly say that yes, there is a difference. If you're an NBFC, you also look at the 100% net owned and the 15% exposure condition. If, you, if you're a non NBFC, you just have to comply with the three year track record and you'll then have the ability to invest up to 400% of the net. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, there is there would be a distinction there between NBFCs yeah. and non NBFCs. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay. Okay, the next one is, uh, is round tripping ODI to FDI transactions in multi-layer companies eased in this proposed regulations or not? I think we've kind of covered this as a part of our discussion. It seems it has been eased to a certain extent, but definitely uh, more clarity is uh, required. Uh, clearly one, one thing that seems to be clear is that the OPI may not be subjected to those conditionalities. Right. At least that's the reading. So that itself is a big clarity in my view for those who are yeah. investing abroad. Uh, the next one is, can an individual invest in a overseas company which has a WOS in India? I think uh, maybe uh, Vijal, you want to look at it and maybe Mohin, one of you can um, uh, either either of us, Vijay, you want to go ahead or, or you want to say? Yeah, please. No, no, please go ahead. Okay. So the, I think that question uh, Sid already mentioned whether it's an overseas portfolio investment or if it's an overseas direct investment. If you have control, then no subsidiary is allowed. Forget about India, it can't be allowed anywhere. And if it's portfolio investment where you don't have control, then uh, uh, round tripping related provisions as long as they are complied with it. that is again my view you know if they given the current reading it should be all right and again okay. one can say that if it's pure portfolio we can say that it's not subject to 19 at all so to that extent if it is portfolio investment it's all right that is within 10 percent without control okay yep i think the next one is please clarify if NRI holding an Indian passport but residing outside India can invest in a gift AIF. I think it's from Ashish Ghosh. I'll take that. Uh, I think uh, today there is no restriction for participation by NRI or NR in in a gift AIF. And then to that extent, uh, that has been actually the bedrock of the AIF regulations and give to facilitate global investment. So there's no restriction on that. Yes, there is a condition which applies with respect to if this gift AIF is investing in India as an FPI, then you have FPI conditionalities which will need to be looked into. So if this NRI, it turns out to be a beneficial owner of this gift AIF which is registering as an FPI, then you may run into a challenge from an FPI regulation perspective. But the gift regulations are pretty uh, clear and flexible. On the other hand, if this gift AIF is a feeder into an onshore AIF, we don't see any limitation uh, of participation by NRIs or even non-NRIs in those structures. Uh, just going on to the next one, uh, and I think which we may have touched upon, this is from Kaushik Mitra. Is there any change in position under the new ODI regulation with respect to receipt of deferred compensation by Indian entities? Uh, receipt of this deferred compensation by Indian entities while uh, pairing stake in overseas entity without or with or without write off of investment. Maybe I think uh, Moen, do you want to take that or? I think it's so basically, mind, I think around restructuring. 
I think that seems to be the. So, or maybe I think the question was if I, if an Indian company has an overseas company and you sell off that company, divest take in that okay. over com overseas company, is there any change in provisions? And to my mind, there is That's some dates and uh, you know, for some uh, no significant change is what I can say. But Kaushik, if you want to drop me a line, uh, yeah, we'll share I'll be that 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 some. Uh, yeah, I think Anuj is best if he. He drops us a line because it's, it's a it's a double edge. Yeah, because question. it's all yeah, no yeah. broad changes for sure. But if there is some nuanced out there, uh, we can examine and drop you a line. Yeah. Yeah. So so here I think uh, this is where the Indian entity is deferring its receipt with respect to uh, divestment of its stake. Uh, I think that is something where I mean the, the deferment that we talked about yeah. related yeah. to payout to a non-resident. An Indian entity is buying a stake and is paying out to a non-resident on a deferred basis. So that seems to have been clearly addressed over here. This question seems to be where the Indian entity having divested its stake uh, and is deferring the receipt of the uh, divestment proceeds i think if, if that's the question i think we may have to look at it because i think there is a 90 day period for you to realize the uh, uh, proceeds so whether that would allow deferment for uh, and, and if so that has not been directly addressed over here so that is something which may need to be examined from a regulatory perspective uh, okay. The next one is how do we interpret the operating criteria for GPs? Uh, so I think uh, Bijal, do you want to kind of say whether I think what I understood the question is that would a GP entity offshore be treated as an operating entity uh, for the purpose of ODI or whether that would be treated differently? Uh, so essentially, it really depends what we are looking at the investment for. If the GP entity is an entity which is, uh, you know, into management services, then of course it would be, you know, it could be considered as an operating company. But if this GP entity is uh, merely an entity which is essentially uh, a pooling vehicle for co-invest or carried interest, then perhaps not. So it would really depend on uh, the nature of operations which uh, are considered to be carried out. I, do, I, do, so I, do, I, I must yeah, admit, I don't I <laughs> understood the question too well. Yeah, no, no, no. I think, uh, again, this will be a little more nuanced as we go along because the question seems to be that whether if I want, as an Indian resident, I want to invest in a GP entity. If it is an operating entity, whether it would if it is an operating would it be treated as a financial services in which case again as an individual i may have a limitation yeah. if it is not yeah. a financial services then maybe there may be a odi uh, whether i would be permitted so i think again this is something we will need to see but i think a gp ownership where a gp has some operations and not into financial services i think maybe something that may be and if you see the bona fide business definition it is very wide and then to that extent if the gp is really a holding company or a holding uh, is, is basically holding interest in other lp entity and no other operations i think the question will be whether that would be a bona fide business of a holding entity or otherwise so i think this is where i think clarity is needed and we'll go into the bucket list of things where thing uh, clarity would be required uh, obviously uh, it's an important question from a fund manager perspective and obviously there's uh, one other nuance over here i think because foreign entity under this regulation has been defined uh, to meet certain criteria and limitation of liability is one of the criteria. Now, obviously, uh, the question that came up in our deliberation that if I were to become a GP as an individual directly into an LP offshore, 
there you might run into a challenge because a GP typically would have unlimited liability, whereas other LPs would have limited liability, and that may not qualify clearly to meet the condition under the foreign entity. So I think one needs to kind of factor that in in the structure. I think we may take one uh, or two last questions. I think uh, in case of transfer of ODI, which involves write off, how do you determine the arm's length price? This is from uh, Ritika Gangwal. Uh, do you want to take that, uh, Moin? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think, uh, see, pricing guidelines is now prescribed as the arm's length price determined as internationally acceptable pricing guidelines. And the way we are reading it is that if it will be in a similar way, like we look at FDI, that if there's an Indian party involved, it's you wouldn't be paying more than what the cap is uh, in you know, And if it's the foreign uh, party who's buying from an Indian party in any way, you know, there's going to be a floor price and you would have to get more than that. Now, that being said, if there is a write off or if there is a reduction in the value of the asset or your investment abroad, then your price that will be determined as the arm's length price will actually be the price that it's valued at. So write-off will be a separate aspect dependent on how much you initially committed or invested. But the value will only be reflective of what it is worth today. So I invested 100 and it's worth 80. The value that a valuer will determine will be 80 and I'll do the deal at 80. The write-off that I'm doing will be a diminution in value for which I'll follow a separate process. And as Anuj mentioned, there is a the way we are reading it is it appears to be a liberalization and uh, you may not need to go for a special approval for that yeah <clears throat> I, I i concur with you and i think some of these interpretations will also need to be looked into the context of the intent of the regulators because if you really see the master direction and i think it, it kind of very clearly refers to the fact that this is part of a further liberalization or uh, simplification so in many ways where there is a gray area i would say that the interpretation would need to be taken in the context of what was the intent if it was to liberalize i think uh, it, it should be something that should be we have an interesting question and i think uh, which is about uh, this is from palvi khandelwal if sbsc is backed by a corporate guarantee from a group company of an Indian entity, then does it require to be reckoned towards a for, uh, financial commitment limit of both Indian entity and the group company? <laughs> it's an interesting so one that if a group to company is given. To go, uh, deeper and examine this, but to my mind, there's no reason it should be reckoned. Uh, towards the limit of both because one will issue SBLC to but if these are clever structuring we'll have to see yeah yeah so I think somewhere this is a group company guarantee we are saying should not at least our current view is it should not be double counted in sense. both the entities that won't be the uh, intent obviously and lastly i think uh, can individuals invest in offshore debt securities this is a question from pankuri swami i think uh, again uh, from a portfolio investment and i think uh, moin please correct me the way i read this clearly uh, listed debt securities is something which is covered within the uh, portfolio investment uh, for individuals and to that extent that may be permitted unlisted debt investments is something which may not qualify for uh, for this purpose i think that's the broad reading of it but uh, i don't know if you have a different view on that no i fully agree with you Siddharth. that is the view and uh, only time when an individual can exposed to debt is if there's an ODI. So that that's, I think, yeah. not in a situation like this. Yeah. That's correct. So, no, I think uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll need to kind of wrap up. I know it has been a long session, but I think it's engaging and I'm sure everyone 
has some food for thought to take away, including us. But I wanted to thank the audience. I think we, uh, we've obviously had a very, very active participation in questions. And we do hope that we have tried to demystify some of the uh, provisions of the new regulations. But definitely feel free to reach out to us. I think uh, we will continue to kind of study this in more detail. And as we get more clarity, we'll be happy to provide uh, answers to your queries so with that uh, i'd like to thank all the panelists once again and uh, we definitely look forward to having more engaging discussion on this uh, as we go along thank you everyone and we'll thank, you, thank, thank you thank you thank you bye-bye thank you